one revealed, and one hidden. The evanescent arrows were truly annoying to deal with. There was no more dodging this time. Remora paused for a moment, and the arrow instantly pierced her forehead. A crisp splat rang out in the air and the witch's skull shattered. Red blood and white brain matter splattered in every direction like raindrops. A pungent rain of blood suddenly fell from the skies as a headless corpse twitched and dropped from above. The fourth grade witch had been killed. The elves who were watching the battle from a distance were about to break out into cheers, but the two elven god messengers standing in the air didn't seem to be showing any joy. They looked at each other with solemn faces and closed the distance between them. Then they started to look at the empty air around them. If these evil witches from the world of adepts were truly this easy to kill, then they wouldn't have become the terrifying tumors of fiend that they were today. That was why the two god messengers didn't let down their guard, despite the scene they had just witnessed. In fact, they became a lot more alert. Ursul knocked his arrow and drew his bow, keeping guard at Xyvia's side. Meanwhile, this god messenger of Searsha started waving her nature's staff about, softly chanting a magical spell. Judging from the intonations and syllables of the chant, it seemed she intended to cast true sight to verify what was happening. Just then, Ursul abruptly shouted, Watch out! His bowstring immediately snapped. Two magical arrows cut across the skies in a strange and mysterious path, landing on an empty spot a hundred meters away. Boom! The bolts exploded and instantly transformed into two nature spells, nature imprisonment and wrapping vines. Several magical vines that manifested out of thin air quickly wrapped around an odd humanoid silhouette like agile snakes in the wild. A small prison formed out of rose branches and green vines also rapidly grew on the outside. However, Ursul's sharp eyes instantly saw through the dense branches and vines and identified that the victim of the spells wasn't the body of the fourth grade pale witch. Instead, it was a terrifying corpse with blood and pus all over its body. The bloody corpse had no skin to speak of. Its entire body was naked, and the surface of it was covered in fresh blood and abscess of all sizes. The corpse didn't seem to care for the tough vines and thorned branches biting into its flesh, and it continued to struggle and thrash about violently. The fearsome blood from its body splashed onto the vines and branches and sizzled as it corroded the plant material. Acrid white smoke rose into the air. This corpse was immensely powerful and utterly fearless in the face of death. Moreover, its blood was no different from a strong acid and had powerful corrosive capabilities. Seeing that the two binding spells could no longer restrain the enemy, Ursul once again drew his bow. This time he was no longer using magic arrows, but an actual physical enchanted explosive arrow. Powerful physical attacks could more easily kill wicked magical creations like this bloody corpse. Just as the explosive arrow was about to leave the bow, the air behind the two god messengers rippled. A nearly invisible humanoid shape emerged out of nowhere. It was a powerful spirit with the abilities of a fourth grade. Her phantasmal face vaguely resembled that of Remora's. This horrifying spirit opened her mouth the instant she emerged in the air before the god messengers could react. A sharp and ear-piercing wail burst forth into the surroundings. Wail of the Banshee It was a true wail of the Banshee in every sense of its name. Its effect was several times that of the wail that Remora had released earlier. The terrifying wailing sound wave beat against the air like waves in the sea. There was no need even to mention the frail flesh of the elves. Even the typically untouchable space started to crumble before the wail, inch by inch, piece by piece. The violent and ferocious sound wave quickly spread into the surroundings, catching up to the escaping windrunners at the speed of a thunder blast. The windrunners then became like dolls and toys being wildly and roughly handled by a massive and invisible hand. They were instantly squashed and folded into the thickness of paper before exploding into a crimson rain of smashed innards and blood. It didn't matter whether they were first or second grade, none survived in front of such a terrifying banshee's wail. 
they were like helpless mortals at this moment, freely and indifferently toyed within the palms of powerful gods without even the slightest trace of the ability to resist. Only those elves with third-grade powers managed to rely on the eruption of their own energy fields to hold off the sound wave attack for a brief moment as they desperately escaped into the distance. Even so, they had paid a terrible price to live. The wail of the banshee wasn't just a sound attack. It also carried with it a fearsome soul attack. It was able to shatter the enemy's soul and kill them simultaneously. That was why all individuals murdered by the wail of the banshee could not be resurrected by revival magic or divine miracle. The situation was dire even in the distance. Necessarily, the god messengers who were in closest proximity to the spirit had to directly endure nearly 80% of the whale's offensive power. The damage they had to receive was far beyond that of the ordinary elf. Fortunately, both of them had experience fighting with the pale witches. At that moment, the two god messengers promptly activated the life-saving divine magic that their respective patron deities had bestowed upon them divine shield. An egg-shaped golden shield appeared around them, helping them to block all of the sound wave attacks safely. The two god messengers turned around furiously while still under the protection of the divine shield. They instantly took out their most potent abilities to deal with this spirit that had appeared out of nowhere. This accompanying spirit belonging to Remora wailed as she hovered to dodge the attacks of the god messengers. Meanwhile, she continued to activate all sorts of soul abilities that broke apart against the divine shields. Divine power was truly a mysterious power purer and more advanced than magic power and energy. The shields constructed from divine power could defend against all known magics and spells, including many spell branches that were so niche that hardly anyone dabbled in them. Upon seeing that her attacks were completely ineffective against the divine shields, the accompanying spirit had no choice but to give up. She started to flee from the god messenger's attack range with all her strength. And how could the enraged god messengers let her escape so easily? Xyvia's face was flushed red from frustration. She raised the nature's staff in her hand, and a brilliant beam of nature's light shone out of the top of her staff, firmly locking onto the spirit's body. Accompanying spirits might be ethereal beings immune to all physical damage, but the cost of that immunity was having to endure double the damage from all magical attacks. That was why this beam of nature's light acted like a strong acid when it landed upon the spirit's body. It was almost as if the spirit had been soaked in an entire barrel of corrosive acid, her phantasmal body steaming and letting out pungent white smoke. The accompanying spirit lifted her head and let out a painful cry of agony. She started to quickly and rapidly flicker and flash through the sky. Sadly, regardless of how she ran, that fearsome beam of nature's light remained tightly focused on her body, grinding away at her existence with the powers of purification. Perhaps because she sensed the agony of her accompanying spirit, the fourth grade pale which Remora finally came out of her hiding. This time, she rapidly transformed into a horrifying shadow tentacled monster upon her reappearance. Her entire body was enveloped by black smoke as dark as ink. She waved a dozen dark tentacles, as thick as stone pillars and several dozens of meters long, smashing them toward the god messengers from every direction. Ursul, who was responsible for protecting the both of them, let his bowstring snap again and again. Several magical arrows that fired from his bow blew up the shadow tentacles in mid-air. However, these dark tentacles were not so easily destroyed. The scattered dark matter moved under the control of Remora's chance, once again forming into new dark tentacles that extended toward the two god messengers. Through their endless regeneration, the dark tentacles were finally able to break through Ursul's rain of arrows, slashing at Xyvia's divine shield. Xyvia was unable to stabilize her body and flew almost 300 meters away, like a rubber ball that had just been struck with extreme force. Though her divine shield had helped her mitigate all of the damage, the unstoppable shock from the impact still interrupted her nature's light. Nearly half of the accompanying spirit's body had been burned away. 
She howled sorrowfully and used dense negative energy to extinguish the nature energy remaining upon her body. She then stared resentfully at Xyvir, with eyes that burned with ghostly green flames, and hatefully concealed herself once again. The two god messengers swept the skies with true sight but failed to find any signs of the spirit. They had no choice but to set their sights on Remora herself, resuming their battle above the skies of Echo Isles. Two fourth-grade elves were fighting against a single fourth-grade pale witch. It looked as if they held the advantage due to their numbers, but the god messengers were still incapable of obtaining any absolute advantage during the fight. After all, every pale witch had an accompanying spirit that they cultivated from their youth. The spirit's power was proportional to their own, and their minds were linked as one, allowing for seamless acts of cooperation. That was why a fourth-grade pale witch was equivalent to the combination of two fourth-grade witches. The only caveat was that one had a physical body while the other was merely a spirit. Which Remora herself was skilled at a variety of powerful dark magic, while her accompanying spirit was a master of soul abilities. The two of them complemented each other, and the sum of their combined force was far stronger than the teamwork of the two god messengers. However, the god messengers were backed by gods and could obtain the support of some powerful divine magic. Meanwhile, the pale witch had her back against the adept's tower and could easily slip into the tower's defensive barrier whenever the winds turned south. Both sides had their advantages and trump cards. It was hard to utterly defeat the enemy before they could muster an absolute numerical advantage. There might be five fourth-grade god messengers in Greenwater City, but if they were to all swarm out at once, Remora would turtle within the tower, refusing to show herself. With a fourth grade witch hosting the tower, the elves would not be able to break into it, even if they committed all of their forces. Moreover, even if they were willing to raise the tower at great cost, they had no way of stopping the fourth grade witch from escaping. With the witch's abilities, they could easily build a new base even if the Echo Isles were to fall out of their control. When that happened, the elves would be the ones faced with more problems. That was why, after a few attempts, the elves gave up on the idea of utterly exterminating the enemy. They chose instead to use a massive garrison and number of defending troops to wait out the calamity of witches. At any rate, these foreign witches couldn't stay in Fiend forever. Once they all started to leave, the wicked pale witches would have to settle down again. The battle between fourth grade powerhouses was a shocking experience for the ordinary elves. The two dozen elven vessels quickly weighed their anchors and ran far from the Echo Isles. In fact, they could still sense the intensity of the energy explosions through the chaotic winds blowing across the hull of the ships, even when they had sailed four to five nautical miles away. There was no longer a single cloud in the blue skies. Thick, dark clouds gathered from every direction, forming into a dense and roiling cloud of mist over Echo Isles and firmly trapping the Isles within. The elves all ran up to the deck and glanced in the direction of the Echo Isles, waiting with hope for their god messengers to return victorious. The waves gradually became more tumultuous and treacherous, and their ships started bob even more furiously. Some elves who had never experienced such conditions immediately exhibited signs of severe seasickness and started vomiting. Meanwhile, the elven leaders gathered at the bow of the ship, anxiously awaiting the conclusion of the battle. Even third-grade powerhouses didn't dare to get involved in a battle between fourth grades, much less ordinary elves. The terrifying wail of the banshee at the start of the fight had easily covered an area of one and a half kilometers. All first and second-grade elves within this territory had already died, their souls having been ripped to pieces. Even the third grade elf that had barely managed to escape had been inflicted with great soul injuries. He had to be sent back to Greenwater City to recover immediately. That was why the commander of the fleet and the leader of the Windrunners pulled the fleet six nautical miles away from Echo Isles due to safety concerns. They would silently wait here for news from the front lines. Yet, while no news arrived, a horrifying natural disaster did. 
No one knew if it was a phenomenon caused by the witch's magic or the intensity of the fight itself, but the Echo Isles in the distance had been tightly locked down with a dense black mist. Violent lightning blasts and fearsome elementum tremors erupted inside the opaque fog, stunning every elf to their very core. While the elves anxiously waited, a piercing voice, due to its owner's nervousness, rang out from the bow of the ship. Quickly erect a shield. Hurry up and have them erect a natural ward. The elves all turned back in surprise and were shocked to find the owner of the scream to be a second-grade elven diviner. This diviner belonged to the Temple of Luck and was a female elf with pretty looks and elegant movements. At this moment, all the color had faded from her face, seemingly because of some vision from the future. Two thin streaks of bloody tears were crawling down from her tightly shut eyes. Still, she seemed ignorant of this fact and continued to yell and scream wildly. Even though the profession of a diviner didn't have any combat power, no one in the elven kingdom dared gloss over their opinions. The fleet commander immediately had the signal troops order all ships to activate their natural wards. As standard ships of the navy, all these vessels had been specially carved with an elven array in a secret room at the bottom of the boat. This array could activate a massive natural ward. To save energy, these barriers weren't usually opened. Now, though the commander sensed no incoming danger, he still decided to lean on the side of caution and listen to the warnings of the elven diviner. As expected, just as the elven ships erected the green natural wards that shielded their hulls, a massive wave of water several meters tall silently surged toward them from the horizon. Even before the wave had arrived, a suddenly advancing hurricane stormed through the area above the sea. The ships protected by the natural wards were relatively untouched. They had not sustained any damage other than being tossed around a little too intensely. However, the aerial forces responsible for scouting the seas and the skies met an unfortunate fate. The savage hurricane was like a wall of wind that smashed at them, instantly dragging the hippogriffs, chimeras, and silver pagazi into its vortex. The poor flying creatures were like tops being wickedly whipped by children, tumbling and falling from the sky without any chance to resist. The elven archers and knights upon their backs also fell into the sea like dumplings being dropped into a pot. The wall of wind had just passed by, and the wave arrived soon after. The two dozen ships were dragged along by the rising wave and smashed into one another. If it wasn't for the natural wards, this single wave alone could have capsized nearly half of the elven ships. For a moment, the elves were thrown into complete disarray. Yet this still wasn't the end of it. Once the wind wall and the wave had passed, a pattering black rain poured down from above. This black rain carried with it a thick and pungent odor of corrosion and landed on the natural wards. Wisps of black smoke rose into the air as the rain neutralized the nature power. The entire elven fleet was in a state of chaos. All of the first-grade elves were hurriedly hiding in the cabins to prevent the hostile environment from wounding them. The only ones that could move around on the deck had to be second-grade at least. The third grades gathered at the bow of the ships. They didn't seem to care about the damage of this phenomenon to the fleet, choosing instead to focus on the black mist in the distance. These were, after all, only the shockwaves of the fourth grade's fight. The true disaster was still locked within that layer of mist. There, the Echo Isles that had been preserved for over a thousand years was facing an unprecedented calamity. Outside the Isles, the reef formations that had endured hundreds of years of tidal corrosion were slowly being chipped away by the violent gales, inch by inch. Apart from the parts covered by the Adept Tower's energy shields, all of the Echo Isles reefs that were exposed above water were non-existent now. Be it the nature magic of the god messengers that was mixed with divine power, or the immensely powerful spells that the pale witches were unleashing through the tower's strength, everything was dealing tremendous and irreparable damage to the environment. Compared to the child's play of second and third grade powerhouses, every single ability of fourth grade fighters was a calamitous finishing move that could destroy the world around them. 
The area covered by their spells and magic was also exceedingly large, often extending up to ranges of two kilometers. There was no apparent disparity of energy intensity in the area enveloped by their spells either. That fully demonstrated the fact that the understanding and mastery that fourth grade fighters had of their magical powers were at a shockingly unbelievable level. The fight between the Pale Witches and God Messengers had also finally provoked another large faction. The surface of the sea around the Echo Isle started to bubble as if the water itself was boiling. A gigantic sea monster that measured six meters in height rose from the water. It had a large and muscular body as well as humanoid arms and a torso covered in dark, green-gray scales. A spindle-shaped head grew above its neck, and a wicked face sat upon it. Two especially sharp and long fangs protruded out of its lower lips as two fleshy extensions hung from its chin. The lower half of the sea monster's body was a flat, long snake's tail covered in fine indigo scales. This siren that had emerged from the sea was also a fourth-grade powerhouse. Its green-webbed hand held a rusty trident as it floated above the surface of the water. The siren raised its trident and shot a towering pillar of water at the few individuals engaged in their messy fight. The Pale Witch and the God Messengers immediately split up after witnessing the intervention of a foreign force. They each took up a spot and glanced coldly at this new challenger. Elves, witches, I don't care what reason you have. None of you are allowed to fight within the territory of us sea folk. The siren roared. The sea folk of Fien used a unique mariner creature language. Fortunately, all the individuals present were important characters of their respective factions, and all had a particular understanding of the sea folk's language. Thus, there was no concern about incomprehension. The arrogant and proud sea folk had always been at odds with the land species, even since the ancient times. Even the elven kingdom, with all their might, had to offer large numbers of offerings to these sea folk if they wanted their elven ships to sail across the boundless deep sea freely. Otherwise, becoming wreckage was the only fate that awaited them. That was why the two god messengers had no choice but to suppress their fury and argue in the face of this unreasonable fourth grade siren, we didn't start this fight. As a member of Feem, I trust you, sir, to also have an obligation and responsibility to keep the peace of the plain. Why don't you join us and help us exile these otherworldly invaders from our world? Kaker, you lot might not like these witches, but we have taken quite the liking to them. They have offered us quite a lot of good things. Rage appeared on the faces of both god messengers when they heard the siren's words. Xyvia even lashed out furiously, how could you trade with a bunch of otherworldly invaders? Can you still call yourselves a member of Fiend now? The wicked siren simply betrayed a mocking expression in response to the elf's reprimand. No more than a group of witches. You fear them, but I don't. If they truly found the courage to find trouble with us sea folk, we would crush them to bits and mince them to pieces. Not a single shred of their corpses would be left. The siren narrowed his murderous eyes and looked up and down Zyvia's curvaceous and bountiful body. He then revealed a lecherous look. Girl, if you are willing to come shag at my coral sea for a few days, I can decide to chase this witch away from the island for you. How about that? The two elves' expression changed utterly upon hearing this. Xyvia's body was even trembling from anger. Her eyes were practically spitting fire. Mind your words, sea folk. You are insulting a god messenger of a great deity. You, do you intend to provoke a war between two great pantheons? Ursul hastily stood in front of the berserking Xyvia and coldly spat out his words. Pantheon war? This siren seemed to be a brazen thug as well. He simply curled his lips in disdain and said, Those weak bin sprout gods of yours. You think they even qualify as a challenge to the greater tree? HMPH. The two elven god messengers almost went insane from the provocation, but instantly realized something from the siren's words. You, you are the god messenger of Atri. 
It was only at this moment that the two god messengers could sense a vaguely familiar aura from the siren's sinister and obscure energy flocks. The opponent was actually also a god messenger. In fact, he was the messenger of the most brutal and savage god of the sea, Atri, god of the sea beasts. The discovery was both shocking and enlightening. As natives of Feen, the god messengers naturally knew who Atri, the god of sea beasts was. If the majority of gods were higher life forms that transcended worldly creatures and possessed superior power and intelligence, then Atri, the god of sea beasts would be a special exception. It was slow, and its mind was little more than chaos embodied. Even its mind and intelligence couldn't be considered as complete. However, there was no denying that Atri possessed overbearing strength and physical power that far surpassed an ordinary god. Even without fancy techniques or skills, Atri could easily defeat half of the elven pantheon with its physical strength alone. It couldn't be helped. After all, over half of the gods in the elven pantheon were not proficient in combat. Moreover, Atri possessed the divine authorities of savagery, cruelty, and regeneration. It was especially worshipped and respected by all the powerful sea beasts in Feen. If one were to weigh the size of the Fiend Plains oceans and the number of life forms within them, there was no doubt that the number of powerful sea beasts outnumbered even the total number of forest elves. With such incredible faith power backing it, the god of sea beasts forcefully pushed itself upon the ranks of the most powerful gods of Fiend, even if it was highly unqualified. It became the second most powerful god of Fiend, only second to the god of the sea, Dion's. If the battlefield was set in the sea, Atri alone would be enough to destroy the entire elven pantheon. Of course, if Atri was able to do this, then so could the sea god Dion's, who held the title of Lord of the Berserk. All sea folk powerhouses that followed Atri, the sea beast god became mindless savages under its teachings. Still, a fourth grade fool was still not an existence that an ordinary person could afford to anger. Ursul and Xyvia had no choice but to swallow their pride and retreat from the battle. Once the two god messengers vanished into the horizon, the fourth grade siren turned to look at Pale Witch Remora. Hey, ugly hag from the world of adepts, when can you send over the blood of the sea you promised? If I find out you were lying to me, I will bring my men with me and smash that garbage shadow island of yours. Blood of the sea was merely a euphemism. The substance was no more than the blood of powerful sea beasts from the world of adepts. The blood of sea beasts of a higher world was undoubtedly an extremely rare and invigorating substance for the sea folk of Feen. The blood of the sea that this siren needed was naturally origin blood of a siren that it shared an ancestor with. Rare resources like these weren't kept in stock by the northern witches, even with their great might and influence. They had no choice but to send men into the depths of the world of adepts' oceans to search for it. Moreover, they had to organize manpower to surround and hunt the target upon finding it. The difficulty of obtaining this blood of the sea was truly enormous. Pale Witch Remora was surprised by this fourth grade siren's wild and rude words, but she didn't resort to hostilities over this. Here in Fiend, the Pale Witches dared to provoke the Elven Pantheon and could hold their own against the Human Pantheon. Still, the only thing they didn't dare do was provoke these savage sea folk. The total volume of the ocean in Fiend was nearly a hundred times larger than the total area of the landmass. Resources were also bountiful and readily available. Naturally, the number of sea folk powerhouses was shockingly high. This sea folk messenger casually spoke of destroying Shadow Island. These weren't holy lies and threats. If she genuinely forced this siren's hand, it wouldn't be hard for it to gather dozens of fourth grade sea beasts from the depths of the sea to break into Shadow Island. Shadow Island might have turned into an impenetrable fortress over the past thousand years of effort by the Pale Witches but all its defensive towers and energy barriers were little more than a joke before dozens of fourth-grade creatures. Moreover, these were massive and gigantic sea beasts that were almost always as large as hills. Lord Bistol, 
the delay can't be completely attributed to us, can it? Even which Ramora had no choice but to explain with a bitter smile when dealing with an unreasonable siren, if you could provide us with some of your own blood, we could naturally match it with our knowledge and find suitable prey for you. However, you refuse to provide any of your blood. That is why all three samples we previously provided you with were not compatible with your essence. Trying to find the sirens that match your specifications in the vast and boundless depths of the ocean is a daunting challenge, even for us. HMPH. I don't care. Don't even think about getting your hands on my blood. You witches love dealing in weird things the best. Who knows what you will do once you get my blood? This fourth grade siren might seem crass, but he had street smarts of his own. He waved the trident in his hand angrily, I will only give you ten more years. If I don't get the blood of the sea you promised me in ten years, then prepare to get kicked out of Fiend. The fourth grade siren turned and disappeared into the sea after roaring these words, vanishing without a trace. After letting out a silent sigh, which Remora also silently returned to the island's tower with her accompanying spirit. The Echo Isle's reef formation had been utterly shattered after this disaster, turning it into hidden reefs beneath the surface of the sea. That caused the waters around the isles to become increasingly complicated and difficult to navigate. However, Remora couldn't find any interest in dealing with this matter. Instead, she hid in her room and silently contacted the fourth grade which stationed on Shadow Island. Let the matter of the so-called blood of the sea be left to the leaders and elders of the clan headquarters. Garen Continent, Airy Peak As a notorious den of magical beasts near the south coast, a flock of windhawks lived here. As wind magical beasts unique to Garen Continent, these windhawks possessed exceptional flight speed and powerful wind magic. Adolescent windhawks had the strength of a beginner first grade. That didn't sound very impressive, but one had to take into consideration the fact that they were an entire flock of magical beasts. A hundred windhawks had built their nests on the sunny side of a tall cliff, resting and reproducing here. As time slowly passed, the number of windhawks here grew in number, and they became tamed magical beasts of the elves. It became a place where druids would come to summon an animal companion. Thus, this place became the famous airy peak. As flying magical beasts with shocking intelligence, the windhawks had always maintained friendly relations with the elves. Furthermore, they had an extreme sense of territory and would unleash the most ferocious of attacks upon any birds or beasts that trespassed in their homes. That was why there were no dangerous creatures that could threaten young windhawks anywhere within two and a half kilometers of airy peak. However, these days, Airy Peak had lost its past serenity, turning into a chaotic and tumultuous place. The cause of all this was a swarm of accursed insects. Seven days ago, a massive swarm of odd beetles swarmed out of the depths of the forest and rooted themselves underground Airy Peak, never to show themselves again. A sky full of adolescent windhawks immediately stopped the large group of elves led by Spear of Vengeance Asia after she reached within one and a half kilometers of Airy Peak. This time of the year happened to be a crucial moment where many young windhawks hatched from their shells. The windhawks would never allow the elves to turn the den into a battlefield, even with their historical relationship. Spear of Vengeance Ajar instantly flew into a rage against this flock of short-sighted cawing featherbrains who did not allow for any negotiations. If it weren't for the elven captain leading the troops finding the courage to stop her, Ajar would probably have started a fight with these windhawks before they could even exterminate the swarm. This flock of puny first and second grade windhawks would probably have had half their numbers annihilated by Ajar in a single move. However, if Asia were actually to do so, then the good relations between the forest elves and the wind hawks would come to an end. The elves had no choice. The hippogriff riders that had been pursuing the enemy could only stop outside Airy Peak, monitoring the surroundings and ensuring the insects would not escape. The elven captain led some men and flew to Greenwater City, a mere 350 kilometers away from Airy Peak, 
to request for aid from the elven commander there. Half a day later, a squad of windrunners numbering less than a thousand men hurried to Airy Peak. One had to admit that the elves could not do anything about this problematic situation, regardless of how much military force they mustered. That was because the enemy was dead set on hiding underground. The elven kingdom had 20 to 30 million forest elves and, naturally, had all sorts of talented individuals. Some had precision archery skills while others possessed sharp movements, some even had the ability to channel powerful nature magic. There were also those that could transform into all sorts of magical beasts. However, oddly enough, not a single one of them could engage in underground battle. Forest elves were strange beings that liked nature, freedom, and art after all. How was it possible for there to be an oddity among them that excelled at subterranean battle? Thus, when the 1000 elves had managed to surround Airy Peak, the topic of smoking out the enemy became the most significant concern that troubled them. Smoke, water, and fire. They tried all these strange methods at least once but failed to force out by the depth billies. Instead, they had made things insufferable for the young hawks hatching in Airy Peak. The elven commander of Greenwater City could only use his connections and all sorts of negotiations to deal with the windhawks. In the end, he managed to persuade this sizable flock of windhawks to relocate to another area temporarily. Once the battlefield had been cleared, the elves started to relentlessly dig at the foot of Airy Peak, trying to excavate the insects that had killed so many of their brethren and exterminate them. Sadly, under Billy's command, the swarm were more sly and cunning than most magical beasts. The tunnels they dug underground were not even a meter thick and did not allow for any elves to move around within. The main areas of activity for the swarm were also concentrated right beneath Airy Peak, where the rock layers were dense and thick. That indirectly increased the difficulty of excavation for the elves. With no choice left to them, the elven commander could only gather large groups of druids that could transform into rock serpents and blindworms to have them change into earth magical beasts to smoke out these wretched insects. As such, a battle between the swarm and the druid transformed magical beasts erupted in the narrow and lightless underground space. In a hidden tunnel a hundred meters under the ground, a new bug's nest was slowly coming to life. Billy's had sent out the remaining 23,000 insects of the insect army in waves to scavenge and hunt for food, even at the risk of being exterminated by the elves. Though they did bring back plenty of woodland creatures, their casualties were no small number either. As many as 1 to 2,000 insects were killed on a daily basis. At the rate this was going, Billy's would be in a desperate position with no insects at his command within 10 days. The remaining six magical mantises were made to stay by his side at all times, leaving him with a base of some high-grade combat insects. Far, far away at the edge of the west coast some of the insects and magical mantises that had been separated from the main army had managed to survive. They wandered into various corners of fantasy forest and hid themselves. If Billy's current location was compromised and his actual body was to be destroyed by the elves, he could still rely on the insect kings hiding in the other insect armies to revive himself. However, the price of such a revival was too immense. It was very likely to cause his power to decrease to the level of a beginner first grade. That was why Billy's would never willingly use such a method to escape the enemy's siege unless necessary. After the attempts on the first few days, Billy's had given up on the fantasy of requesting help from Lady Mary. It was his reckless act of seeking help that had allowed the Spear of Vengeance to track him down through the weak elementum flux he emitted. He had been forced to abandon a 10,000-strong insect army during that battle to bait the enemy and draw them away. Sadly, Fantasy Forest was the home of the forest elves. Here, the elves would note any bit of movement in the grass or wind immediately. That was why Billy's journey of escaping was fated to be so difficult and arduous. In fact, there were several times where the third grade elf almost trapped him in his temporary dwellings. It had been over 3,000 kilometers of cat and mouse between him and Spear of Vengeance Ajar. 
Up until now, Billy's had never met her face to face. Even so, his insect army had fallen from its peak of 170,000 to its now pathetic state of 20,000. The number of intermediate first grade magical mantises had also been reduced from 27 to 6. The blood and tears behind this were hard to understand unless you were in Billy's shoes. Here, beneath the strange airy peak, bug adept Billy's was able to figure out the situation above through hidden eye bugs, even though he didn't take a step above ground. It was clear that his reckless and rampant actions had utterly angered the elves. The elven sky patrol circling airy peak didn't cease throughout the day. The woods were also being tightly guarded by the flying scouts of the elves and druids that had transformed into critters, practically turning the place into a fortified stockade of its own. Without sufficient meat, it was hard to hatch an endless army of insects. Without flesh of high quality, it was hard to breed powerful combat insects. At this moment, Billy's enemies completely surrounded him. Any swarms he sent to the surface would never return. Still, the bug adept had not given up hope of escaping. Billy's took advantage of the slight gap before the elven encirclement was complete, sent out large amounts of insects, and fortunately succeeded in obtaining some flesh. With these blood treats and the sacrifice of some of the ordinary insects, Billy's finally succeeded at breeding some odd worms with a unique ability, burrowers. They were a type of strange creature that resembled massive earthworms. Their bodies were 12 meters long, and at their fronts were many sharp teeth arranged in a dense concentric formation. These saw-like teeth that resembled an array of blades extended all the way into their deep black insides and were the tools with which they devoured and shredded everything. Burrowers were not picky eaters. Their fearsome stomachs would shred and digest anything as long as it was an organic substance that they could absorb. The swarm might have some ability to burrow and tunnel while under Billy's command, but the structure that they had developed was still primarily meant for rending and tearing flesh for food. Burrowing through the ground with them not only created tremendous commotion, but was also an incredibly slow process in and of itself. To dig his way to survival, Billy's had no choice but to make some sacrifices and use the flesh and shells of part of the swarm to raise these special burrowers. When the first burrower broke through its nest and appeared before Billy's, the excitement within his heart was no less than that of the very moment he had advanced to a bug adept. Yet, before he could take a closer look at this burrower, a dozen insects in a tunnel 250 meters away were exterminated in a single strike. Billy sighed helplessly then gritted his teeth and revealed a wicked smile. These druids had become more and more daring over the past few days. Again and again, they entered the underground labyrinth, navigating the winding bug tunnels and cracks to search for Billy's. Some of the searching druids were combat squads composed of first-grade druids. If Billy's were to send out his only remaining six magical mantises, he would be able to teach these druids an unforgettable lesson, especially in such narrow and small spaces. However, some second-grade druids were hidden within many of these druid squads. If the magical mantises were to run into them, their chances of escaping alive were no more than 30%. Thus, every time Billy's lookout insects were killed, he would hesitate, unsure of whether to send his mantises to retaliate. This torment tortured him day and night, consistently and continuously. In the previous battles, Billy's had no choice but to resentfully relinquish the idea of a counter-attack due to his lack of information. The most important reason for that was his multitude of priorities, he needed a group of soldiers that could protect him at his side constantly. Now that he had the burrowers, escape was a very real possibility. Consequently, Billy's thoughts and attitude shifted drastically. The desperate and deadly flight had now turned into a situation of tremendous flexibility. As such, Billy's had the idea of holding a fun game with his enemies. The insect army that had been on the defensive over the past few days once again swarmed into the ditches and tunnels en masse, charging and assaulting these druids' squads from every direction. As the intensity of the battles increased, 
some previously unclear information started to gather in Billy's brain like a downpour of raindrops. As the conditions of the fight in the entire labyrinth appeared before him without reserve, Bills quickly decided upon his opponents. It was a combat squad formed of three first-grade druids. One of them had transformed into a massive serpent a dozen meters long and was responsible for exploring and being the group's vanguard. The two druids behind him had turned into different animals. One was a massive gopher, sniffling with his long and slender snout for smells in the tunnel, while the other was a rough and bumpy toad that stood upon the serpent and looked around with its bulbous eyes. The stench of rot in the tunnel frustrated the three druids to no end during their trip in the labyrinth. They might have turned into magical beasts and possessed the might of magical beasts, but their minds were still those of humans. That was why they could tolerate such a dirty and filthy environment, instead of actually taking a liking to it. The three of them formed a group. The giant serpent was good at picking up tremors in the ground, the flashing gopher was good at smelling odd scents, and the poison arrow toad had great dynamic perception. They complemented each other and possessed fairly synergistic teamwork. They were silently exploring the tunnels and forks before them while using nature magic to leave special marks along the way. It was their slow and gradual progress that had lit up a large half of this underground labyrinth. Perhaps they would have been able to fully explore this complicated and winding labyrinth if they'd had another two more days. By then, the maze would be littered with magical marks, and the insects would have a much harder time scampering about under cover of darkness and chaos. As long as they could find the bug adept, the few second-grade druid masters would ensure that the wicked fellow would never escape again. The dark and narrow tunnel sprawled out before them. It was pitch black. Surface creatures would not be able to see anything here without dark vision. The tunnels here were no more than one meter tall or wide. If those elven archers were to come down here, they would probably have to crawl forward uncomfortably. If it were those elven soldiers with their blades, they probably wouldn't even be able to draw their sabers, much less fight. That was why a jack-of-all-trades profession like a druid was the most suited for battlefields that required adaptation. This isn't right, we seem to have been surrounded by the enemy. The serpent leading in front stopped slithering. He used his sensitive feel for physical movement to pick up on the familiar chattering and vibrations in all tunnels around them. It was possible, perhaps, that large numbers of insects were swarming toward them through winding tunnels all around them. Insect assaults of this scale were sporadic since the swarm had been severely crippled. Why don't we retreat first and report this abnormality to the higher-ups? The gopher raised its body and betrayed a humanoid expression of hesitation upon its furry face. There were, at this moment, eleven druid squads searching for that bug adept. Only five of those squads had second-grade druid masters within their ranks. Sadly, they weren't one of those squads. That was why the gopher immediately cowered in fear upon sensing the movement of the swarm in the distance. After all, their strength was limited in this narrow and enclosed space. They couldn't cast their powerful nature magic at all. Otherwise, the resulting collapse of dirt and stone would be enough to kill them. Those insects would definitely destroy the marks we left behind if we were to retreat just like that. Our whole day's worth of work would have been for nothing. Let's not retreat or advance. Tor, take the fork to the right there should be a stone hall thirty meters away from us. It's not much room, but it should allow us to fight inside it. I have already sent a signal for help. We only need to hold our own for a while, and the surrounding groups will come and reinforce us. In the end, the most senior poison arrow toad croaked and decided on the strategy. The three-person team didn't hesitate at all. The gopher and the toad leaped onto the serpent's back and quickly pushed into the pitch-black tunnel. They then dove straight into the right tunnel at the three-way fork that appeared in front of them. Mere moments after they left, the chattering sound closed in as a swarm of insects charged out of the tunnels and passages. They also unhesitatingly followed the serpent down the right path. 
For a moment, the sounds of shells rubbing against each other filled the underground tunnel. A terrifying and bloody slaughter was still ongoing in the dark and narrow tunnel. The druid that had transformed into a serpent opened his fanged mouth, biting and spitting poison at the swarm and dealing decent damage with every attack. The long tail dragging behind him was also frantically sweeping and waving about, slapping and smashing the pursuing horde into patches of meat paste. Sadly, these insects didn't seem to understand death and continued to surge recklessly toward the druids from both sides of the tunnel. Even if they were crushed to death by the serpent the very next second, their only thought in the present was to lunge at the serpent and tear a piece of flesh out of its body. Under the fearless assault of the swarm, the snake was soon covered in wounds, despite its sturdy body and fine scales. Countless fine cuts had appeared on its body. The flashing gopher and poison arrow toad sitting upon the serpent's body were also trying their best to exterminate the swarm assaulting them. Burning fire spells and poison arrows caused countless casualties among the black beetles, burning the insects into charcoal and melting them into pungent slime. An indescribably pungent odor filled the entire tunnel. Finally, after cutting his way through the swarm and knocking down a wall of insects, the serpent succeeded in bringing its companions into that wide stone hall. It was called a stone hall, but it was no more than a ten-meter-wide cave formed by erosion by underground water. The changing of the underground stream's path left behind this damp and sinister stone hall. This place was just as narrow as everywhere else underground, but it was much taller than the one-meter-tall worm tunnels. The three druids quickly transformed into their human forms after rushing into the stone hall. They then raised their oaken staves and hurriedly cast rejuvenation and rapid regeneration upon their bodies. Sadly, before they could treat the wounds on their bodies, the pursuing swarm dig their way into the cave through the tunnels and the cracks in the wall, once again throwing their insect bodies at the druids. Aoooooo. After a massive roar shook the entire underground labyrinth, one of the druids quickly transformed into a gigantic earth mauler. He unhesitatingly charged at the dense and terrifying swarm. Of the two other druids, one transformed into a mighty giant raging ape and turned to attack the swarm as well. The other quickly turned into a treant form and used a large area of thorns to trap the incoming insects. He then unleashed several green halos and enhanced his companions with all sorts of support nature magic. Bramble Thorn Armor Nature's Blessing Bark Skin Revitalization Bark Skin allowed the target's skin to become as tough as hundred-year-old bark and resisted weak piercing and slashing attacks. Bramble Thorn Armor formed a magical shield layer over the target's body composed of green vines and thorns. The shield could not only resist physical and elementum damage but could even reflect parts of the melee damage it took. Nature's Blessing was a type of support nature magic that was most commonly used by the elves. It could raise all aspects of the target's attributes, strength, agility, physique, and elementum resistance. Revitalization provided the target with stamina and spirit regeneration, lasting for approximately 120 seconds. One couldn't look down upon the elves because of their slender and weak build, nor because their strength and physique were inferior to tough and muscular magical beasts. Even an ordinarily harmless rabbit could instantly become a ferocious lion when reinforced with all these layers of magic spells. Thus, the three druids started a bloody battle to the death with the invading swarm in this crude stone hall that was no more than ten square meters. The excessively narrow terrain gave neither side too much room to dodge or move. The only thing they could do was use their bodies of flesh and blood to endure the enemy's assault and retaliate with their most wicked attacks. Battle techniques and means of murder were inconsequential in such a scenario. The only useful things were strong physical defenses and ferocious offenses. At first, the two tanking druids could still hold off against the wild strikes of the swarm with the protection of bark skin and bramble thorn armor. However, when the green shield was scratched into shattered sparks by the hive, the earth mauler had no choice but to roar and cover himself with a layer of stone armor. 
The giant raging ape also did something similar and covered his body with a yellow armor. They had both chosen to transform into earth magical beasts that were known for their toughness. As such, they could still hold off the enemy for a bit longer through their abilities, even after losing their elementum protections. The treant being protected by them in the middle was also now surrounded by hordes of beetles. He could only lift his wooden legs and stomp about as much as he could. His thick arms had also turned into long tree whips, violently lashing at the dense swarm. Insect blood splashed everywhere as shells cracked and splintered. The entire hall tremored and shook. Horse battle cries filled the air, along with the sound of pounding fists and the deafening chittering and chattering. The black tide of insects gradually covered the three towering silhouettes in the stone hall, it was difficult even to see them now. One only knew that they were still alive and stubbornly fighting by the occasional insect corpse that got flung across the room. Just as the three druids were slipping up against the ferocious swarm, a few black silhouettes climbed up above them along the walls. The next second, an order was given as the six magical mantises split into three groups. They all lunged down from above and stabbed or slashed with their exceedingly sharp limbs at the bodies of the druids. Ah! A pained, loud cry reverberated throughout the stone hall, spreading in every direction through the tunnels and the cracks between the rock layers. A group of three druids was fighting its way forward in another underground tunnel. Suddenly, they heard that low, gravelly roar of agony from the depths of the underground. A druid that had transformed into a jaguar lifted his head and betrayed an expression of immense shock and fury. It's tall. Something's happened to his squad. This druid had an extremely close relationship with Tor. His heart felt like it was boiling in oil when he heard the agonized cry of his friend, and tremendous anxiety and anger overtook him. Despite how much he increased the speed at which he struck with his shadow claw, he was incapable of finishing off this group of several hundreds of insects. He was helpless in the face of this emergency. The druid in the group that had transformed into a woodpecker calmly arranging its feathers had a sudden shift in expression. A dangerous and murderous light gleamed in the woodpecker's eyes. The bird leaped forward as its body rapidly started to swell and distort. In the blink of an eye, he had transformed from a harmless woodpecker into a fire lion shrouded in magical flames. His lithe and powerful body had just formed, and the surging fires had already burned the remaining beetles in the tunnel to a crisp. His intimidating lion's head turned back and shouted out, Follow closely. He then turned and charged into the distant darkness without looking back. Along the way, the raging fires on his body occasionally stretched and shrunk, scorching the beetles that were continuously squeezing out of the cracks in the walls. The druid quickly leaped into the depths underground. These scattered swarms of insects could not possibly stop the advance of such a powerful second-grade fire lion. The two first-grade druids immediately followed after that scorching path of flame in joyful surprise, closely following behind the second-grade druid master. Just as the druid master quickly entered a new tunnel after a fork, the path he was previously in mysteriously collapsed. The two first grade druids stopped their feet in shock. Before they could even figure out what it was that had happened, the chattering sound in the tunnel grew louder and louder. The dark, black swarm emerged from various tunnels, ditches, and cracks, trapping the druids in here. Behind the squirming swarm, for black shapes were also silently approaching. A dozen seconds later, the death throes of two druids also rang out of this place, sorrowful and tragic cries. Bugger depth billies had to send out two intermediate first grade magical mantises with every group as insurance for dealing with those beginner first grade druids. Moreover, with the tide like swarm, the druids that had their escape path cut off had no chance of fleeing. Billy's, who had found his ticket out of this sticky entrapment, would have trouble bringing such a tremendous number of insects with him. To thoroughly squeeze every bit of utility out of the remaining 20,000 insects, Billy's didn't mind committing to such an extravagant and wild strategy. 
The bug adept utilized his familiarity with the labyrinth and his comprehensive grasp of the battlefield at all times to toy with the enemy, working expertly with strategies such as isolating, cutting reinforcements, interventions, and fixed ambushes. Billy's trapped all the druids in a sea of insects at the price of exhausting his swarm, then proceeded to lay traps and bait as he liked. Once a first-grade druid was isolated, Billy's would unhesitatingly strike out, even if he had to lose thousands of insects to accomplish his goal of killing the druid. He would either collapse the tunnel and separate the enemy or simply send out the swarm to stall the second-grade druid. At any rate, those trapped first-grade druids couldn't dream of escaping unscathed once Billy's found an opportunity to strike. With the masterful use of the labyrinth's advantage and the rapid exhaustion of the swarm, the casualties to the druids underground started to rise exponentially. The hidden second-grade druids didn't seem to realize the severity of the issue at first. By the time they started to sense life auras vanishing quickly in succession, they could no longer hold back. All of them burst out with their full force. At this point, the number of insects had also been drastically reduced from its initial 21,000 to its currently meager 4,000. Billy sensed the constant explosions of energy flux in the labyrinth and finally gave the order to retreat. All surviving insects seemed to have gone mad at that instant, wildly throwing themselves at what remained of the druids. Bug adept Billy's used a secret tunnel to gather with five of his magical mantises as well as a thousand insects carefully picked out from the swarm in a spot underground. The barrower that had just hatched was laying here, taking large bites out of the druid corpses sent over by the insect army. It had only been half an hour, but its powers had improved tremendously. It had evolved from a young worm to a grown worm. Let's go. Billy's hissed under his breath while cloaked in his black robes. The burrower, now thicker, started to crawl toward one side of the wall like a massive snail. The speed at which it moved was almost infuriatingly slow. However, the moment its fat intestinal body touched the stone wall, its concentric formation of sharp teeth pierced the earth, and the burrower started to suck. The rock layer that was meant to be even tougher than steel had a one and a half meter long tunnel dug out of it. Don't judge the burrower based solely on the fact that its entire body was made of flesh and fiber. It was important to note that burrowers were the best option when dealing with earth and rock layers. Much like a swimming fish tossed into the water, the initially fat and slow body of the burrower suddenly turned agile. A smooth and wide tunnel appeared before Billy's eyes at a rate visible to the naked eye. The shaft was still quickly spreading forward. Billy's nodded in satisfaction as he lifted his leg and jumped onto a magical mantis. The mantis then dove into the tunnel with him upon it. The other magical mantises quickly followed after, as the 1,000 insects following at the very rear marched forward along with him while also trying their best to destroy the tunnels behind them. As large clouds of dirt and sand collapsed from above, this tunnel that had just appeared was quickly covered and buried under thick sand and dirt. Someone's got their eye on us now. Alice casually said. She was currently, elegantly, sitting in front of a wooden table, slowly spreading the tarot cards in her hand. The back of every single tarot card was carved with delicate and mysterious patterns. Apart from some eye-catching colors in the patterns, the cards only had meaningless magical lines on them, especially to the eyes of outsiders. However, in the eyes of the fate witches, every wave and turn in these patterns were soaked with an indescribable aura of mystery. These patterns were formed from twisted letters and symbols that only diviners could accurately decipher. It was clearly a damp and dark underground stone hall. Yet, if one were to look at Alice's elegant and casual appearance, her delicate and extravagant silk robe, the expensive velvet tablecloth upon the table, and the flashing crystal ball at a corner of the table. Grim had a mysterious feeling in his heart. He felt as if he were inside a breezy hall of paradise, holding a crystalline wine glass in his hand, swirling its contents, and enjoying the fragrant scent within as he silently listened to the sweet words of a beautiful diviner. Perhaps this was a unique aura of fate witches. 
They could always take someone's mind beyond reality and place them in an enchanting and fantastical scene. Graham rubbed his right fingers together and confirmed that there was no such crystal goblet in his hand. He then awkwardly sat straight and pursued a question with a frown on his face, can you confirm who it is that has their eye on us? Well, there's definitely one clone of a moonlight goddess among them, advanced third grade. Alice was still slowly flipping the tarot cards over, we have already offended her thoroughly. Do you believe me? The moment our positions are exposed, a portal will instantly open before us, and swarms of second and third grade powerhouses will emerge from within. Second and third grade powerhouses, Grimm sucked at his teeth. His head ached. The Crimson Clan was only a newly established adept clan right now. Most of its clan members were no more than beginner or intermediate first grade. If they were to run into the clone of the Moonlight Goddess with their current strength, the enemy would crush them as easily as she would crush ants. The reason they could still live on so comfortably at the moment was due to their stealthy and constant movements. If the enemy intercepted them in Garin, he he he, the terrifying consequence was one that Green didn't even want to imagine. Moreover, that Moonlight Goddess clone isn't the most troublesome of them all. It almost seemed like Alice wasn't aware of what she was saying. She was still talking as slowly and casually as before. You mean, we have even more troublesome enemies to deal with? Grimm's frown deepened. Of course. Alice pursed her lips and smiled. The damp and dark stone room was instantly lit up by her smile, that pretty girlfriend of yours did a good job. She even managed to catch the attention of the main elven god, Saoirse. Fortunately, Saoirse only cast down a manifestation of her holy will. Her combat power isn't that strong. Grim laughed awkwardly and intentionally ignored how Alice referred to Mary. Instead, he carefully asked, how strong is your isn't that strong? Probably just begin a fourth grade. Alice's smile became even brighter. Holy crap, beginner fourth grade. Grim's feelings were practically falling apart. The fourth grade divine manifestation of the elven chief gods will was probably nothing to the fourth grade pale witch. It would be like a meat bun challenging a dog, that clone would be done for. However, if she were to deal with them, then even third grade dark witches are would not be able to escape with absolute certainty. As for the remaining adepts, they would most certainly be condemned to death. There was no chance of survival. Green then frowned as he spoke. This is the main reason you have been forbidding the flying ship from mobilizing. Of course. Over the past few days, the two goddesses have been keeping their eyes fixated on the southwest coast. If we dare to show ourselves, the next group of people to intercept us would be a large group of high-grade spiritualists. Then, are we safe here? There has to be at least one or two gods amongst the elven pantheon that specializes in divination and prophesies, aren't there? Green was suddenly tense again. HMPH. The elves would already have made their way here by the time you thought of that. Alice rolled her eyes at him unamusedly, isn't that why I had my witches carve so many anti-divination arrays on the island over the past few days? It's all to obscure the scrying and senses of the elven gods. Alice seemed to have been reminded of the fate witches that died during the last battle upon saying this. Her eyes silently turned red. If they wanted to master the powers of fate, the fate witches had no choice but to sacrifice the magical powers they had formerly possessed. However, without the protection of their magical powers, every single fate which was as frail as paper. These witches who claimed to have control over the powers of fate could only latch onto certain powerful factions if they wanted to establish themselves in the tumultuous and dangerous world that was the world of adepts. The fate witches might have a pair of eyes that could see through the complex world of possibilities, but they did not have sufficient strength to alter or obtain anything. For example, Alice herself had severely exhausted her life due to the excessively frequent use of the powers of fate. 
her remaining life force was not sufficient to sustain her until her advancement to second grade. Thus, if she wanted to take the risk and undergo advancement prematurely, she had no choice but to steal herself and enter this fiend plain populated by pantheons of gods. The practically powerless Alice had only managed to establish herself in Garen with the dedicated support of Grim and his subordinate Crimson Clan. The current situation might still be shrouded in mist and clouds without a clue as to the best step to take next, but at least she had successfully secured a seat at the table. The entirety of Garen was like a massive chessboard. The only ones who were qualified to make moves upon it were either gods or fourth grade witches like Remora. Even third grade witches like Kazar could only be used as chess pieces that charged forward mindlessly. They had no ability to influence the outcome and direction of the game. Alice was only first grade now and was even less qualified to play against the gods. However, the powers of fate were truly mystical. There were plenty of times where they didn't rely on face-to-face -face confrontations against the enemy to acquire victory. What she needed to do now was to secure her position as a player and silently observe the changes and state of the chessboard. Then all she had to do was wait until the time was ripe to use all her power to snatch away the most insignificant chess piece from the enemy's board. One could say that Alice's most significant advantage was, in fact, her immense weakness. It was because of how weak she was that no chess piece or player would treat her as a noteworthy character alongside the gods and the fourth grade witches. That then gave her the possibility of laying out the board and influencing certain outcomes in a calm and composed manner. However, it was still far too risky to attempt to shift the direction of the chess match, even with the combination of fate witches, dark witches, and the crimson clan. Over the past few days, Alice had been hesitating between advancing and retreating. She had been even more frustrated over the chaos of the chess match. However, Alice couldn't help but acknowledge the power of Grimm's subordinates. Forget the fact that this mysterious fire adept was such a powerful individual himself, even the few subordinates he had somehow recruited were all so unorthodox and weird. Mary was a second-grade vampire after all. She led her vicious blood knights and blood elves, running from the west coast to the north and extending the fires of war to the north-central section of the fantasy forest. That bug adept Billy's was even stranger. He was only an advanced first-grade adept, yet he was jumping about with all the liveliness in the world despite being surrounded by second- and third-grade elves near Greenwater City itself. It was important to note that Greenwater City was currently a military stronghold. Even the number of fourth-grade powerhouses and god messengers probably exceeded five, not to mention the second- and third-grade combat professions that likely numbered in the double digits. An insignificant and tiny bug adept was digging through their very beds and had yet to be exterminated. This. Alice tilted her head and thought for a moment. She couldn't find the appropriate words to praise this cute bug adept. In truth, it was the multi-pronged distractions of bug adept Billy's and bloody Queen Mary that allowed the central mountains that had always been shrouded in the dense mist of fate to be ever so slightly exposed. Even though Alice could not yet divine anything concrete about the area, this was an excellent omen. At the very least, she had already managed to divine some of the information related to the staff of divination. A massive stretch of mountains oddly stood out in the center of the boundless forest of Garen. These mountains stretched from the west to the east, covering a distance of tens of thousands of kilometers. The center of the mountains had lakes, rivers, gorges, and valleys. Of course, most of the terrain was still mountainous forest. The central mountains could be said to be the absolute core of the entire elven kingdom. The massive temple district was located at the northeast part of the central mountains. There was an exceptionally wide and silent valley of plains there. Tall and steep mountains surrounded the plains, and thus, the place had been excavated by the gods and turned into an extensive temple district. As the rulers of the forest elves, the elven court were also loyal slaves of the gods. 
they didn't dare to stand on the same pedestal as the temples of the gods. Consequently, the entire court was built upon a neighboring stretch of forest in the central mountains. A massive and ancient tree of life towered there, having lived for 30,000 years. The entire elven court was built around this tree of life. It was said that the chief elven god, Sirsha, personally planted this tree of life, and that this was one manifestation of her true form and that this was where the pulse of the fate of the entire race of forest elves laid. Meanwhile, the staff of divination that Alice was determined to acquire on this trip belonged to a second-grade green dragon Ogu. The dragon cliff upon which this second-grade green dragon resided was located at the foot of the central mountains to the west. It could be considered one of the more rural areas already. Alice originally had no idea as to how to obtain the staff of divination. However, in the past few days following the chaos sowed by Mary and Billy's, some strange movements had been incited within the central mountains. At the same time, it allowed Alice to vaguely peek at a chance to obtain the staff of divination. There was a serene and deep forest valley. The geography of the land suddenly swelled deep in the woods. Tall and uneven mountains were everywhere. Among them, there was one particularly eye-catching and lonely mountain that pierced the clouds. This 18-kilometer tall mountain stood proudly at the western edge of the central mountains. The upper half of the peak was even hidden above the shifting clouds. On the west side of this steep precipice, caves of various sizes had been dug into its rugged cliff. The only ones that could move around here were the large and ferocious dragons. Noon. A loud and drawn-out dragon's roar suddenly rang from the distant horizon. A single tiny black dot slowly increased in size and descended on the green dragon dragon cliff that was famous in the entirety of the Fiend Plain. The wild winds swept everywhere as a massive silhouette wove through the clouds. They flew across the sky with their wings spread out, putting their proud and magnificent body on display for everyone to see. It was a terrifying being a whole twelve meters tall. Dark green, bowl-sized scales covered their entire body and caused the dragon to shine blindingly under the bright sunlight. The giant dragon's head was two meters long, and light green smoke shrouded their snout, adding a hint of mystery to their identity. One could vaguely see the terrifyingly green acid ball behind the dragon's throat between flashes into their colossal mouth. The massive and wicked spikes extended from the back of their necks and all the way down their spine. As the dragon beat their broad and scaled wings, a powerful gale flowed around their elegant and perfect body. Green Dragon A forest green dragon that had entered adolescence. Green dragons were one of the five chromatic dragons, the most commonly seen dragons in the world. They possessed acid breath and were relatively weak in combat. Of the five chromatic dragons, their strength was only just slightly more powerful than the water dragons. As such, they were often seen as inferior lower dragons by the higher dragon races. This green dragon soared in the air with their wings spread apart for a moment then looked down at the towering dragon cliff below. Finally, the dragon decided on a spot, folded their wings, and doved downward at an extreme speed. The appearance of a dragon was always eye-catching, regardless of the location and time. Inside the dragon cliff, several dozen green dragons extended their heads from their own caves and let out deafening dragon roars at this unexpected visitor. For a moment, the surroundings of the dragon cliff were filled with continuous dragon roars, utterly terrifying the nearby birds and beasts of the woods. Amongst the many roars, there was one particularly hoarse and loud voice that stood out. Ogu, you brat! Why have you come to the dragon cliff again? We do not welcome you here. The one speaking was a high-grade green dragon whose size and seniority was far superior to the visiting dragon. Judging by its large dragon's head and thick, slender horns, he was a third-grade green dragon. Yeah, yeah, you disgrace of the dragons. We don't welcome you here. Almost as if the third-grade green dragon had incited them, the many green dragons residing in the dragon cliff erupted with all sorts of roars. 
Outsiders might have a hard time understanding anything from those deafening roars. Only dragons could fully comprehend this unique language, dragon tongue. Chase this thief away. We can't let him get close to our dragon cliff. The powerful and prideful dragons were synonymous with nobility and sanctity wherever they went. They were higher life forms that all low grade creatures could only worship and look up to. Yet today, when a conflict broke out among their ranks, they were behaving no different from shrews shouting at each other in a wet market. The green dragon known as Ogu was only second grade. He wordlessly flapped his wings and floated in front of the dragon cliff in the face of these riled crowd. It seemed he was waiting for something. As expected, a short moment later the commotion and noise in the dragon cliff were disturbed as a beautiful dragon covered in emerald dragon scales dove down from the upper half of the cliff and elegantly appeared on the scene. Unlike the muscular and rough bodies of the average green dragon, this higher emerald dragon had not only a more slender and aerodynamic body, but also finer and more delicate scales. What stood out even more about her was that noble and elegant aura of hers, along with a perfect body. The appearance of this emerald dragon immediately silenced the place. Rough and ragged breaths could be heard. Iritina. It was Iritina. As the youngest and prettiest female emerald dragon of Garin, Iritina's beauty was incomparable and acknowledged by all forest dragons. Ignoring everything else, just the number of individuals among the green dragons that treated Iritina as their idol would be enough to form an entire regiment. Unfortunately, Iratina was not only a beautiful dragon but also an extremely prideful one. Don't even bring up the mixed blood green dragons, she couldn't even bring herself to fancy a single one of those young emerald dragons that barely managed to make it into the ranks of higher dragons. As a result, the matter of Iratina's partner had always been something that troubled the elders of the emerald dragons. However, apart from her pride, the dragon beauty Iratina was exceptional, be it regarding her personality or her bloodline. Consequently, she became the object of pursuit and desire of all these green dragon subordinates. Iratina beat her slender and delicate dragon wings lightly and let out a crisp and sweet roar at this young green dragon that had drawn the eye of the crowd, Ogu, you have already been exiled from the dragon cliff for taking the personal property of your clansmen as your own. Why have you come back? The other green dragons immediately started making noise at the outsider after hearing Iratina's query. Many green dragons even flew out of their dens, flaring their wings and puffing their chests, hoping to leave a good impression in front of Iratina. In the state of the dragons, the personal wealth of every dragon was holy and untouchable. Even the closest of relatives or the greatest dragon god himself had no right to take that which belonged to another dragon. Thus, acts of theft and robbery against dragons were the greatest sins that would enrage all dragons. It was no wonder that green dragon Ogu was exiled from the safe and comfortable dragon cliff for infringing upon this law, even if he was an adolescent second grade dragon. Oh beautiful Iratina, I heard you have yet to choose your mate. Thus, I wish. Green dragon Ogu's words were interrupted by thunderous dragon roars before he could even finish. Every single green dragon that sought Iratina's fancy flew out of their dens and circled Ogu, loudly cursing and shouting at him. Some fellows who thought themselves courageous even started to roll up their sleeves and prepare to beat up Ogu. A traitorous and abandoned green dragon such as himself dared to chase after Iratina. The green dragons were infuriated. It seemed they were prepared to start a fight at any moment. The pretty and composed emerald dragon beauty couldn't help but roar in embarrassment at the sight of this nonsensical display. All of you, stop! Don't you forget, this is Dragoncliff. All dragons are forbidden from fighting in here. Those eager teenage dragons finally backed down sheepishly when they heard Iratina's reprimanding words. You want to chase me? Iratina finally landed her beautiful eyes upon green dragon Ogu cold as the morning star. Yes, beautiful Iratina. Someone as pretty as you will not find your match in this nest of useless fools, the muscular and ferocious green dragon Ogu roared loudly, 
this trash. Not a single one of them is my match in single combat. Even amongst those emerald dragons, you can't find many as strong as I am. So, beautiful Iratina, choose me. I will use all my wealth to decorate your beautiful room. All the green dragons couldn't help but draw in a cold breath of air. This ogu was actually willing to take out all his personal collection to pursue Iratina. This, this was simply too shocking. For a moment, all the green dragons cursed angrily, but their voices unavoidably turned softer. I will find for myself the wealth that I require. I do not need your offerings. The beautiful emerald dragon Iratina raised her head proudly, and that pretty dragon's horn upon her head glistened with blinding light. Then what do I need to do to win your heart? Green Dragon Ogu shook his head in frustration. I might not have known what in the past, but I do now. Iratina said in a soft voice, a few days ago, the elven court extended a request of aid toward us. Those evil witches are wildly massacring the villages of the elves near the edges of Fantasy Forest and desecrating their land. That is why Fantasy Forest needs us, the elves need us. That is why I wish to gather a group of volunteers to follow me and expel those evil witches. The previously gossiping dragon flight immediately fell silent upon hearing Iratina's resolute declaration of war. Expressions of hesitation and avoidance appeared in the eyes of all the green dragons. Many green dragons even let out subdued cries, What? Has a new round of the calamity of witches broken out again? They couldn't help it. There weren't very many beings that could harm creatures as powerful as green dragons in the fiend plane. Sadly, the witches were one such powerful and evil group of beings. These terrifying witches came from the legendary world of adepts. They all possessed evil and strange magic. Above all, they had fearsome magical equipment. There weren't many weapons in Fiend that could directly harm the body of a dragon, but there were far too many individuals among the witches who had dragon-slaying weapons and techniques. That was why even the lofty dragons had a very high rate of mortality when fighting the witches. The green dragons had practically no natural predators with their status in the great fantasy forest. That was why the green dragons were reluctant to risk their own lives to help those elves. However, the green dragons were forest dragons as well. They naturally had great compatibility and intimacy with forest elves, the children of nature themselves. Moreover, the construction of the dragon cliff and the excellent offerings that they enjoyed on a daily basis couldn't be separated from the help of the elves. Thus, those green dragons who were friendly with certain elves couldn't help but start deliberating on the elves' request for help. I will go. For some reason, Green Dragon Ogu was the first to volunteer himself. With him taking the lead, many green dragons started to offer themselves as well. A satisfied smile finally appeared on Iratina's pretty face. How long do you intend to hide before you move? Azar stopped Alice in the dark underground corridor and complained with dissatisfaction in her voice. That flying ship has already been repaired for a long time now, yet we are not taking the chance to move. Instead, we are hiding on this godforsaken island. How long are we supposed to hide? One could easily tell that the twenty days of idle activity upon the isolated island had left the third grey dark which anxious and frustrated. All the witches carried on their shoulders the mission of their clans and the hopes of their people when they came to this other world. It had been almost two months since the activation of the planar gate. That meant that this trip to Fien was already a third of the way over. Yet, the progress of their mission was still minimal. The mission of abducting a small-scale tribe of elves was practically finished for Azar. All she needed to do from now on was to visit a few more scattered villages, and she would be done. However, the other mission of robbing the Pegasus magic springs was still shrouded in mystery. No clues or plans were yet in sight. Before she came to Garin, Azar had intended to rely on the power of the Pale Witches to snatch the Pegasus magic spring from the hands of the elves. However, when she arrived at Garin, 
she had been disappointed to find that the elves had complete control and dominance over Garin. They had put together an anti-evil alliance formed purely of fourth-grade fighters and god-messengers that were keeping the Pale Witches utterly locked out of the continent. It had been so long since the eruption of the Witch Calamity, but fourth-grade Pale Witch Remora had yet to take a single step upon Garin. This, this was far beyond Azara's expectations. To prevent Remora having her accompanying spirit sneak past Greenwater City and enter Garin. Those otherwise unoccupied god messengers and fourth grade powerhouses would occasionally go and attack the Echo Isles. Without her accompanying spirit by her side, Remora herself didn't have sufficient power to fend off the combined strength of multiple fourth grade powerhouses. Thus, through such a stupid method, the elves had forcefully managed to tie down Remora and her accompanying spirit to the Echo Isles. As long as the Pale Witches still wanted to hold possession of this ideal foothold off the coast of Garin, Remora would have no choice but to remain stationed at the Echo Isles, bitterly waiting for those bastards to challenge her patience. In all honesty, if the elves truly intended to raise the Adept's Tower on Echo Isles, all they needed to do was set all five fourth grades of Greenwater City on the attack. Remora wouldn't be able to deal with such a massive power differential, even with the tower at her back and the tremendous teamwork between her and her accompanying spirit. However, the elves didn't do so out of their own considerations. If they destroyed the Echo Isles and routed the Pale Witches, this particular fourth grade witch would no longer have any obligations or concerns weighing her down. Provoking and infuriating the Pale Witches didn't seem like a good idea when the elves didn't have an absolute guarantee to exterminate them yet. Fourth grade strength was the limit of power within most planes. Even if the gods themselves were to descend, they would not be able to exert more power beyond peak fourth grade. The gods didn't have any dominating advantage over fourth grade powerhouses apart from more significant knowledge and technique. As such, destroying the den of the pale witches and enabling them to break into Garen to murder and seek revenge as they wanted would only inflict even more severe and massive losses on the elven kingdom. It was precisely out of this consideration that the kingdom chose to take the strategy of sieging the high-grade witch and continuously challenging her. The result of this strategy meant that the Echo Isles of the Pale Witches had virtually turned into a training grounds. A fearsome battle between fourth grade powerhouses would break out over the islands every so often. Without exception, every fight would end with casualties, but never severe enough to cripple either side. The frequency of these events and the passage of time quickly caused Desar to lose interest in these almost scheduled fights. What worried her more was the loss of time. Alice returned Desar's questions with a sweet smile. Which is our you should know as well that our previous activities have already drawn the attention of the elven goddesses. Before they shift their gazes away, any reckless actions on our behalf will only spell doom for the entire group. Azar fell silent for a moment before finally speaking again. There's no need for us to lie to each other anymore. Was the descent of the moonlight goddess last time you're doing? Why else would it have been such a coincidence? Those spiritualists descended upon us right after our battle concluded. Alice smiled again. We are already allies. Why would we ever try and trap our allies? Not to mention, we fought till the very end during that last incident. The price we paid was even more severe than that of you dark witches. Or do you think I would push my own subordinate fate witches to their death? Azar was speechless in front of Alice's questions. The Dark Witches had suffered a lot of casualties and deaths during the last battle. Still, apart from two of those casualties that had been directly exterminated by the God Messenger along with their souls, the others had all revived on Shadow Island. In comparison, the Fate Witches were far more tragic. Their numbers had been cut down to half the original. That male adept had spent a great deal of wealth to summon a third-grade dragon. Even the flying ship had been functioning at maximum capacity. It was all these factors that caused Azar to be unsure of their motives, even as she had her suspicions. Moreover, 
she was currently asking for a favor from them. Azar had no choice but to gloss over the issue and not pursue it any further. Alice, you are the leader of the Fate Witches. I wish to borrow your power of divination to investigate some things. She was bowing her head and asking for a favor from a tiny first grade witch. It was only natural that Azar was hesitant in her speech. Alice's heart moved slightly. The smile on her face grew even brighter. She had been curious about the goal of the dark witches in leaving the larger party for Garen all this while. Understanding this would be advantageous for her grasp of the situation's future developments. Sadly, these dark witches kept a tight lip and didn't allow Alice to get any information out of them. Now, the leader of these dark witches personally intended to tell her. No matter how you liked at it, this was good news. That said, the more that this was the case, the more important it was for Alice not to betray her enthusiasm. You want me to divine? This is an otherworldly plane, you know? I am not being supported by an astrology platform either. The price I would have to pay for a divination would be far too large. Hesitation appeared on Alice's face. Don't worry about that. I understand the rules of fate which is. I will definitely be able to afford a reward that will satisfy you. That is good. Then why don't we go to my room? The two witches walked as they talked, their voices gradually vanishing down the dark and damp corridor. The pursuit and slaughter in the woods were still ongoing. Both sides were giving it their all, but the battle still seemed bloody and worrisome. Squads of elves leaped through the dense trees of fantasy forest as if they were flying, weaving between the top of the ancient trees as agile as monkeys and apes. Several blade dancers with long sabers and naked upper bodies fully covered in elven combat tattoos ran beneath them, sprinting past the bushes below like flashes of lightning. They were giving chase, and they were fighting. The targets of their pursuit were those flocks of crimson bats flying and swerving between the trees at extreme speeds. These bats were blood red, be it their bodies or their hair. A single look at these creatures would fill people with a strange, sinister feeling of dread. These odd bats were not creatures commonly found in fantasy forest. Every one of them seemed to have extreme intelligence, occasionally splitting up and escaping while also gathering together to retaliate. Every one of their movements and attacks was so surgical and trained that it was impressive. The pursuing elves knew very well that these bats were not forest creatures or magical beasts. Instead, they were a sort of unique witch creation that had never before appeared in Fiend Plain. Indeed, they were not natural magical creatures, but magical creations produced by those evil witches through the use of their fearsome magic. Their name was, Vampire. Each crimson bat was a vampire of its own. They had two completely different forms, one being their current bat state that allowed them to easily fly, escape, and hide. The other was their human form. Their human forms were so ordinary that most elves had trouble picking up on their abnormalities, at least until they revealed their bloody fangs and crimson eyes. Much like ordinary humans, they did not have scaled skin and very rarely wore metal armor. That caused their physical defense to be extraordinarily low, so much so that they were incapable of defending against any physical or magical damage. Yet the strange and terrifying thing about them was their ability to regenerate through sucking blood. It didn't matter how severe the wound was. All sorts of injuries would heal completely in a matter of seconds as long as they could get a few mouthfuls of blood. Even those vampires that had been reduced to ashes would be able to revive in a surge of brilliant crimson light as long as there were vampires wildly ingesting blood nearby. It was these two racial traits that allowed the weak vampires that lacked any ranged spells to be able to hold their own against the pursuing elven army. It was more than enough to illustrate the terror of vampires. Even more horrifying was the fact that a group of second grades hid amidst these vampires. These second grade vampires were like the rulers and controllers of the flock. They hid in the shadows, commanding the vampires to strike and retreat as they played a game of guerrilla warfare in the vast fantasy forest. 
As an elven army sent out by Skywater City, these elves were not weaklings either. Be it the melee warriors that were the blade dancers, or the long-ranged attackers that were the elven archers, the elves came in numbers of hundreds and thousands. There were plenty of specialized professions like druids, casters, and tamers within their ranks as well. With all these advantages on their side, the elven army kept a close pursuit on these accidentally exposed vampires, playing a game of cat and mouse in the boundless and complicated fantasy forest. There were no easy opponents among those that dared to travel to a different world and freely roam about in enemy territory. Mary's vampire army had swollen like a rolling snowball after she took advantage of Billy's drawing away the attention of the Skywater City elves. However, the ravaging of the vampire army incited Skywater City's response, a standard elven army of 3,000 soldiers. From Chimera squads to Druid squads to Green Fairy squads, in all seriousness, the elves were treating Mary and her vampires as an actual army. After a sloppy battle at Morgan Valley, Mary had unhesitatingly led all her vampires away in an attempt to escape. She had no choice. The vampire's survivability was truly powerful, but they were still far from being able to fight with a proper elven army. Without qualified defenders and ranged units for cover, the vampires were exterminated by an accurate barrage of elven arrows before they could even get close to the elves. The vampires that, luckily, managed to approach the elves due to the cover of trees and terrains were surrounded by war dancers the moment they showed themselves. This batch of newly converted vampire spawn experienced a tremendous loss of physique, strength, agility, and intelligence compared to actual vampires. The blood elves who endured the intense change of blood and did not regress into wild beasts were a minority after all. Ordinary elves could only be modified into these inferior vampires that just knew how to obey orders. Moreover, they had only just completed the alteration of their blood and were yet unused to this half-elf, half-vampire form of theirs. They might still be as quick and agile as before and possess ferocious attacks, but there was a hint of numbness and clumsiness when they switched between their bat and elven forms. In truth, this weakness wasn't all that serious, but it was magnified when they were dealing with extremely agile war dancers. The movements of these vampire spawn were slow, dull, clumsy, and unresponsive in front of these war dancers and their two narrow elven sabers. They were practically the ideal training dummy. When both parties passed by each other in the woods, snow-white flashes of blades would shine in the night, and the heads and limbs of vampire spawn would go tumbling in the air. It was only the first clash of the battle, yet 317 of Mary's 400 vampire spawn had been pinned to the ground by sharp arrows. The other 83 were also experiencing an agonizing death by a thousand cuts beneath the blades of the elven war dancers. The vampire spawn army had utterly fallen apart a mere three minutes into the start of the battle. Having run into an iron wall, Mary unhesitatingly brought the remaining vampires with her and went on the run. To avoid the vampires from escaping, the elven commanders hastened the elven army forward in full pursuit. In doing so, they became incapable of maintaining their previously sturdy and well-defined dynamic defense. Squads of elven archers rode hippogriffs above the towering canopy, trailing behind a shocking number of bats. They made sure to fly at least a hundred meters in the sky out of concern of an ambush from the vampires. They could only occasionally see the rampaging crimson cloud of bats through the gaps in the canopy. Their job wasn't to attack the flock of bats but to point the elven strike team below in the right direction every so often. As such, their safety was pretty much guaranteed. At the very least, they had not let these vampires escape, even after several dozens of kilometers. Yet, just as they reached a dense stretch of the forest, the cloud of bats vanished without a trace. The excessively dense leaves and full canopy made it exceedingly difficult for them to figure out the enemy's tracks. With no choice left to them, the leader of the archers could only lower the height of her hippogriff and circle above the canopy in hopes of finding something. At the very moment the hippogriff riders descended, the forest beneath them trembled as six crimson silhouettes shot out from within. 
these shapes had grey, demon-like bat wings behind their backs. The distance between them and the riders rapidly closed as they beat their wings and soared into the skies. Enemy assault! Attack! All the hippogriffs started fluttering amidst panicked cries and calls. They quickly drifted outward to avoid the enemy's charge. While the hippogriffs repositioned themselves, the riders on their backs stabilized themselves with their extraordinary sense of balance. They then drew their bows, marked their arrows, and quickly intercepted the enemy with their bolts. Zing, zing, zing. The countless snapping bowstrings rang out as numerous arrows shot toward these crimson silhouettes at speed faster than the eye. Strangely enough, these crimson shapes had no intention of dodging in the face of this rain of arrows. Instead, they endured the arrows and charged into the skies. These figures then let out battle cries, and crimson arcs of light, soaked in savage blood energy, cut across the sky in every direction. The hippogriffs that failed to dodge in time flared their wings and cried out loud. The next second, their corpses split in half and fell from the sky in a rain of blood. As for the riders on the hippogriff's back, some had keen senses and left the area covered by the crimson light arcs just in time and were saved by other nearby hippogriffs. Some elves couldn't respond in time and were cut by the crimson arcs of light along with their hippogriffs. These elves were diced to pieces before they could even shout out in agony, falling from the sky in bits and chunks. For a moment, the hippogriff's squad had been thrown into utter chaos. These crimson silhouettes took advantage of their panic and flapped their wings once again, launching a fierce charge at the elves as if they were knights of the skies. Three blood knights and three blood elves. All of them were powerhouses that possessed pseudo-second grade power. Moreover, they did not fear the attacks of these elves, allowing them to charge fearlessly like a tiger let loose upon a herd of sheep. They slaughtered the hippogriff squad, letting broken corpses fall from the sky like raindrops. Chio, Chio! A series of magical beasts calls rang from the distant horizon. Realizing that the scouts had been attacked, a large group of Chimras and silver pegasuses was rapidly approaching the battlefield, carrying many more elves on their backs. A sound rang out in the forest below before the reinforcements could enter the fight. The six crimson silhouettes turned and quickly vanished into the woods, disappearing without a trace. By the time the elves arrived, only a flock of continuously rising hippogriffs were left, along with broken and severed bodies hanging from the branches below. The pungent odor of blood forced its way up the nostrils of the elves, choking them and almost making them vomit in disgust. The high-grade druid that had hurried to the scene stomped his feet in anger. At the same time, he couldn't help but be shocked at the ferocity of these vampires. There is a group of second-grade people in the enemy's ranks. The scouts will have a hard time if no powerhouses are escorting them. A high elf standing upon the back of a muscular chimera frowned and said, Lord Antaril, it seems we can only leave the task of tracking the enemy to you. This person named Antaril was a third-grade druid elder. He belonged to the congregation of the Talon and could transform into two types of ferocious third-grade avians. That was why the elven commander kept him at his side. Third-grade fighters often had extremely high status and positions in regular elven armies. Even the leading commander could not enforce any tasks upon them. You would have to discuss any matters of necessity that required their attention with an amicable tone. Moreover, this particular third-grade druid elder wasn't even in the army, he belonged to the congregation of the Talon. The commander would have to rely on their personal relationship to issue any orders to the druid. It was important to note that no druid elder would ever act alone. A dozen high-grade druids draped in green leaves and vines stood behind Elder Antaril's back. Amongst them were as many as four second-grade druid masters. Even the remaining druids were elite druids with individual specializations of their own. Such a powerful druid squad would be a treasured elite unit in any elven army. They wouldn't hastily be sent into battle out of fear of suffering casualties. However, they had no choice today. 
To avoid letting the vampires escape, these druids would have to serve as vanguards and scouts. Leave it to us. The druid elder was clearly a close friend of the commander. He very generously spoke, these evil fellows. They have already ravaged the elven villages near the west coast. I was just thinking of settling that debt with them. Let's go and show them a little color, shall we? The druid elder roared, and eighteen druids in eagle helms raised the staffs in their hands in unison. They quickly transformed into giant eagles and feather-winged serpents amidst a blinding green light. They then duff forward into the forest. The druid elder, on the other hand, rapidly turned into a massive thunder rock, spreading his wings and soaring ahead. The size of this thunder rock and the intensity of the electricity that clad its body was shocking. With such a group of druids leading the way, the safety of the elven archers was finally ensured to some extent. The routed hippogriff squad gathered together once more. Their numbers had been cut in half, but the remaining riders were still in good spirits. They all requested permission from the commander to continue their pursuit. With the consent of the commander, this squad of only twenty hippogriff riders quickly followed after the giant thunder rock and pursued in the direction of the enemy. Several kilometers behind them, a large group of war dancers, archers, and green fairies were traversing the forest in a loose formation, trying their best to keep up with the flying scouts. One had to acknowledge that the vampires were not the match of this elven army when it came to frontal warfare. However, when it came to a battle of mobility, this elven army wouldn't be able to touch the soles of the vampires' feet, even if their numbers increased tenfold. It couldn't be helped. The vampires had unique physiques. They only needed to suck some blood from forest creatures to maintain their stamina and energy. Meanwhile, while these elves were all elites, they were still made of flesh and blood. They were far from being capable of competing with monsters like vampires in terms of stamina. The woods were dark and the trees towered above everything else. From inside the dense forest, the branches and leaves seemed to have cut up the sky into fragments of light. Spots of radiance scattered from the skies, flickering as the leaves swayed in the winds. The vast and seemingly boundless greenery of the forest extended without end, from stout bushes to towering trees. This place was like a paradise of plants and nature's treasury itself. Iron oaks, firs, spruces, cedars, and all sorts of arbor trees grew straight towards the sky, their magnificent and towering bodies an impressive sight to all. Meanwhile, all types of nameless vegetation and vines filled the gaps between the trees, leaving no spaces at all. Any outsider would find it difficult to walk in such an ancient and primal forest. At this moment, two odd groups of people were recklessly engaged in pursuit through the great fantasy forest, fighting ferociously with all they had. Fleeing at the forefront was the vampire army led by Mary. Though this group was described as an army, their actual number was no more than two hundred, while those that could be considered elite vampires numbered only three dozen. Despite it being such a motley crew, they were able to transform into palm-sized crimson bats and weave between the branches, wildly escaping the mad pursuit of the enemies behind them. The ones chasing after the vampire army were a group of only a dozen strange birds with excessively ferocious appearances. Most of them were large hawks with golden talons and silver wings. These birds could reach up to two meters tall when standing upright, while their wingspan easily measured four meters long. The rest of the flying creatures were odd flying serpents with wings upon their backs. Blinding electricity rumbled across their bodies as they flew. As large flying beasts, their bodies weren't suited for such high-speed flights in the woods. However, they were oddly able to traverse the harsh terrain, occasionally flaring their wings and riding upon the winds while sometimes folding them to maneuver between the branches and leaves. A terrifying wind blade or lightning blast would shoot forth whenever their green eyes locked onto a flying bat. It was just too hard for a vampire spawn to dodge instant cast magic like this with their power. That was why several crimson bats had been exterminated in the skies along the way. On the other hand, 
the hastily organized retaliation of the bat had absolutely no effect upon the pursuers. The rumbling lightning would exterminate a vast majority of the bats before they could even get close. As vampires spawn with only the strength of an advanced apprentice, their bodies lacked magic resistance and were as thin as paper beneath the eyes of elite druids. As for their ability to regenerate by consuming blood, that was utterly useless before a tidal storm of lightning. The only ones who could hold their own against these pursuers were the blood knights and the blood elves. Even the first grade vampires had trouble guaranteeing their own safety. However, Due to the threat of the giant thunder rock above, Mary didn't dare to send her elite squad to execute the pursuers, even after a great deal of hesitation. Both parties quickly traveled the forest during this pursuit, traversing a distance of a hundred kilometers within a single day. At this point, the power of the vampire's unique physique was slowly starting to show. The vampire still had energy to spare, but the druid squad was at their limits. Finally, the pursuers were gradually left behind, and the vampires screeched as they continued into the depths of the forest. They flew on for another two hours in the forest and eventually stopped near a short cliff when there was no longer any trace of the druids. Though the vampires had unique physiques, an entire day of continuous exhaustion had still caused the blood energy stored within their bodies to fall to extremely low levels. Night had already fallen by now the entire forest was engulfed in heavy darkness. After they had set camp, large swarms of vampires scattered into the surrounding woods to find blood treats. Meanwhile, Mary gathered a group of her subordinates and silently started to discuss their plans for the upcoming days. It was undeniable that they would never dare to set foot anywhere near Skywater City anymore. Their reckless actions before this had infuriated the upper echelons of the elves. The fact that this elite elven army had managed to intercept them near the west coast was no coincidence. Rather, it was a planned operation of extermination on the elves' part. Mary summoned a few of the blood elves and quickly gained an understanding of the situation after some questions. Within the ranks of the elven army, the elven commanders were often accompanied by elven diviners. Apart from their immense knowledge that allowed them to understand the geography of the entire continent and recognize all sorts of flora and fauna, these individuals were also prophets. Prophets. They were undoubtedly the most difficult opponents amongst casters, as well as the type that Mary was most reluctant to deal with. As a second-grade vampire adept, her confidence in slaughtering elves inside the elven kingdom's sphere of influence with a ragged crew all came from the agility and stealthiness of the group. She wouldn't even consider touching excessively strong elven cities and groups. The ones she chose to deal with had always been delicious food that had been specially selected and that she could easily swallow. However, if an elven diviner came looking for them and provided guidance, the advantage of the vampires would no longer exist. This group that Mary had spent so much effort into raising would instantly be cast to the winds if elves surrounded them on all sides. In fact, if one were to be brutally honest, even a second-grade vampire adept like Mary would have plenty of trouble escaping unscathed. While Mary and the rest were softly discussing the problems with frustrations in their hearts, the angered and anxious roar of vampires came from the woods in the distance. What's the matter? What's happened there? Mary suddenly stood up. Her crimson eyes glimmered in the darkness. At that moment, her spiritual senses picked up on four spiritual nodes that had their connection severed with her origin power. It seemed the enemy had exterminated them. The forest in the distance suddenly buzzed as several dozens of crimson bats swarmed out from within. They cried and circled around as if avoiding something. While Mary was still lost in confusion, the sound of snapping bowstrings rang out without stop. Several odd arrows shot out from the forest and pinned a dozen of those bats to an ancient tree. It's the elves. Mary and the rest realized the enemy's identity almost immediately. Even though Mary was very confused as to how the elves had been able to catch up so quickly, she still led her second-grade subordinates into the forest. 
The fantasy forest at night was just as mysterious and unpredictable as it was during the day. The fantasy forest in daytime was dark and dim. Ironically, the fantasy forest of nighttime glowed with a faint light due to a large amount of microscopic moss and magical plants. This bit of faint light wasn't enough to illuminate anything for an ordinary person, but it was more than enough for Mary and her vampires to see as perfectly as if it were daytime. Everything inside the vast and deep fantasy forest seemed so serene and obscure, so peaceful yet quiet. Mary looked around her and couldn't help but frown. The enemy? Where was the enemy? She couldn't see any living beings in her crimson field of vision, much less elven archers. Those arrows had been shot out from right here. How could they have escaped so quickly? While Mary was thinking to herself, the sound of ferocious winds broke out from the shadows of Fantasy Forest. Massive barrages of wicked and accurate arrows came out of nowhere, forcefully engulfing the vampires in their range. Several of the vampires and old fox Vanlier were hit due to their lack of experience. The sound of arrows piercing flesh rang out in succession, and the vampires let out muffled grunts. Three of the blood knights drew their swords and swung them around, deflecting most of the arrows. They then endured the few unfortunate arrows that pierced their bodies without even flinching. As this was happening, Mary extended a slender, white hand, the fingernails painted with daffodil juice. She flicked her fingers several times and managed to flick away the arrows directed at her. The casualness of her actions terrified the fellows that were hiding in the darkness. Lights flash, and her silhouette trembled. The area where the arrows had come from flickered and the horrifying silhouettes vanished once again. Three blood knights had charged to the spot and hacked the rose bushes to pieces. Strangely enough, they found no enemies. Hidden enemies? As they were still caught up in shock, a few dozen more arrows shot out toward them at extremely close distances. This time, they did not have the fortune of shielding themselves with their swords, they were instantly pincushioned with a rain of arrows. Mary's eyes froze. She saw it clearly this time. These arrows had practically shot out right by the side of these three blood knights. It was almost as if they were standing in an encirclement of hidden elves while being utterly oblivious of that fact. The crossbow arrows were forged of refined steel. Delicate magical patterns had even been carved on them, seemingly imbuing them with the effects of pierce and windwing. The former was to increase effectiveness against individuals with heavy armor or tough skin while the latter was to eliminate the sound of the shattered wind as the arrow shot across the sky. That was why the arrows that had pierced the bodies of the three blood knights were all enchanted arrows. Moreover, those who could afford to use such expensive enchanted arrows couldn't possibly be ordinary people either. Even with seven or eight arrows through their bodies, the three blood knights were still vigorously waving their long swords. Large crimson sword blasts were being fired from their blades, slicing the surrounding trees and bushes to pieces. An ancient tree where an enemy was hiding seemed to have been cut down during this chaos because a slender shadow jumped down from a falling tree. The silhouette rolled on the ground and quickly vanished as they leaped into the shadow of another tree. The next second, Mary had already appeared at the position where the enemy had vanished. She looked around her with crimson eyes as they flickered with a strange light. In the shadows behind her back, where her eyes could not reach, a dark and lightless dagger extended from the shadows, silently stabbing toward the back of Mary's head. A spotty shadow was cast down through the leaves and branches due to the moonlight, entirely concealing the magical aura gathering upon the blade of the dagger. See I. The energy at the tip of the blade only erupted at the moment the dagger was about to make contact with the skin. A tremendous and overwhelming aura of energy spilled forth.